Welcome back to Primitive Organic Garden today. I was out in the garden harvesting some things for dinner and realized that I haven't done a garden video update in, I don't know, probably at least a month now. And I figured while I was doing a garden video update, I might as well talk a little bit about food security because that's a hot topic at the moment and you know having a large garden and hobbies like hunting and fishing can really help you avoid having to be dependent on a grocery store which is a good thing in a time like this but uh, a lot of people think oh well you know I don't have a 10 acre farm I live in a small apartment I can't take control of my food security sure you can um, you can definitely still do things like hunt and fish but you can also grow, you know, herbs and salad greens indoors or on your apartment, you know, patio, balcony. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about different levels of food security. So I would say there's a lot of different levels of food security. The first level is, you know, just trying to grow a little bit of herbs and some salad greens. If you're somebody who eats a lot of, you know, organic spinach or organic lettuce and chard and you like things like basil and you know, herbs like dill and, you know, if you're eating a lot of microgreens and things like that, you can grow those. <clears throat> you can grow microgreens and salad greens and most herbs indoors if you have to under, you know, fluorescent lights. And you can also grow them on a porch. So here we got, you know, some basil and some parsley and a bunch of different kinds of lettuce and some more basil some weird cactuses and some aloe vera and some dill and some chard some more basil and chard and this is all stuff you can just do on a porch these are just little tiny fabric pots some of them are one gallon two gallon some are little clay pots um, really doesn't take much effort so that's the first level, you know, look at your uh, look at your grocery bill and if you're spending a lot of money on things like organic spinach and organic lettuce, just start growing it. And then I think the second level of food security would be, you know, get beyond the point where you're just putting herbs and salad on the table and really start growing a lot of different vegetables. I got a little carrot patch here and uh, this was just a little piece of the yard and I threw some compost on top of it. And, I mean, there's just dozens and dozens of, you know, large, healthy carrots in here. This is very, very easy to grow. There's just plenty of carrots. I also started a, a little front yard garden here. Pulled quite a bit of potatoes out of here yesterday. Also have some bell peppers in here that are doing pretty well. We had some uh, blue potatoes and yellow potatoes that all came out of this small little front yard. You know, this was just a couple of uh, pieces of s scrap wood that I, you know, used as a border. Threw some compost in there. Planted some potatoes and peppers and flowers. Got plenty of flowers out here to uh, attract pollinators. Let's go take a little look in the backyard. So yeah, we've kind of looked at, you know, what you can do if, if all you have is a small porch or a small apartment balcony or patio, you can do lots of, you know, fabric pots of herbs and salad greens, even if you don't get much sun. If you do get sun, you can start to do things like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, and you can even use, you know, the balcony rails as a trellis. I'm really excited about all these shishito peppers. A lot of people make the mistake of harvesting shishitos green. Um, they really are a lot better red. But, uh... <clears throat> so yeah, in terms of levels of food security, I'm not at level four yet. Level four is where you're providing all of your own food. You know, that's where you're providing all your own vegetables, all your own starch, all your own protein. 
I don't really have enough land for that yet. I don't have chickens or goats or rabbits or any other, you know, source of sustainable protein. I could possibly do a small aquaponic setup and have some, you know, fish, but I live pretty close to fishing spots, so I don't think it's worth it for me to set up aquaponics right now. But uh, I've finally achieved like level three of food security recently. That's where you're providing most of your own calories. So like level one we talked about, you're providing like things like herbs and salad greens and you're saving a lot of money on your grocery bill if you do it right. You know, look up the things that are most expensive on your grocery bill, like things like organic spinach and try to grow those. So level one, you know, you're not putting calories on the table, you're not providing a lot of your own food, but you're still saving money because you're focusing on those high value crops. And then level two is where, you know, you're putting a decent amount of food on the table. It's a lot of vegetables, but uh, you're not putting the majority of your own food on the table and you definitely don't have, you know, protein or calories. Level three is where you get to like, you're putting calories on the table and the majority of your own food comes from the garden or the farm, but you still haven't reached the point of complete self-sufficiency. So I'm at level three this year for the first time. I've been gardening here 15, 16 years. I've always been at like level two. This year I started putting serious calories on the table between potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, turnips. I even did some grains this year, did some, you know, uh, rye and some barley. Um, but between the potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the squash, I've been actually putting a lot of calories on the table this year, doing a lot of beans, starting to do more soybeans, um, starting to actually put protein on the table from the garden. Finally getting to the point where I have more food than I can eat. You know, when you're at, you know, level three of food security, you're probably producing more food than you can actually eat, but you're not necessarily covering all your nutritional bases. So I don't, I don't have my protein covered yet. And I also don't have my cooking oils covered. I can put more food on the table than I can eat, but I don't really have a sustainable way of producing oil or protein. <clears throat> my protein options right now are basically hunting and fishing, and I'm not really good at either one. So we're just going to keep looking at some of the things in the garden. Again, we got more of these shishito peppers. Um, I think I'm going to ferment a lot of these. They're really, really good if you lacto-ferment them. The shishito pepper has the best flavor of any pepper I've ever tasted, but the key is you have to be patient and let it turn red. If you harvest shishitos green and fry them like most of the recipes say, it's just going to be kind of like a bell pepper with a slightly lower quality texture. But if you let the shishitos turn red, the flavor is unreal. <clears throat> got quite a few uh, red pear tomatoes coming in. Uh, still got more potatoes to harvest. Um, have some weird radishes and turnips that like popped up even though it's no longer spring. Um, I mean, it's like the middle of summer now and it's 90 degrees and there's turnips popping up, which is really weird, but I'm not complaining. Um, even more red shishito peppers in here. Shishitos have done much better for me than bells this year. Um, I had maybe 10 shishito plants and they've yielded more than the 50 bells I've had. Um, the bell peppers are looking pretty good this year compared to previous years. I mean, I've never had a year where I grew bell peppers that were as big as my hand. These are like the gigantic ones that you see at the store, but, uh, they haven't turned red yet. And a lot of them died from like weird unexplained diseases. Um, that's why these beans are here. I didn't really want these beans here, but these were spots where bell peppers were growing and they just died from weird unexplained diseases. So I planted bell, uh, beans in place of the bell peppers. Got a bunch of sweet potatoes over here. Again, we talked about putting calories on the table. So this year I planted like 36 or 38 potato plants and each potato plant is gonna yield between three and eight pounds of potatoes. So that's, that's actually a ton of calories, which is really good. And then as soon as the potato crop is over, the sweet potato crop is going to start coming in. And sweet potatoes are even more calories than regular potatoes because they got all the extra sugar in them. So uh, here we got some more shishito peppers still. Uh, there's a blackberry patch back here that just kind of popped up randomly. I've been meaning to do some foraging from that. Um, still got some kale, a lot of leeks. Uh, this is a green bean patch here that I planted, but blackberries have kind of invaded it. Um, but there's definitely still some green beans in here and the blackberries are almost acting as like a protective fence for the green beans now, but, uh, yeah, we're probably going to get in here and harvest some of these today. Um, most of these are pole beans and hopefully they'll keep climbing, but I noticed a lot of them haven't climbed as much as I wanted them to. 
but uh, they definitely are producing pods, but it's going to be a hassle to kind of really get in here and harvest all of the pods. But we're going to make an effort to do that today. There's a bunch of green beans in here we need to harvest. I also wanted to show you all the UFO squashes that are coming in and doing so good. Again, putting calories on the table. Things like potatoes and squash are calories. They're not just, you know, little produce items to add next to your entree. Most years, you know, I would get most of my food from the grocery store and the garden would be like an accent to the meal. And now this year, especially with the pandemic, the garden is always the main course of the meal now. And I'm lucky if I have one item from the store. So a typical meal right now might be something like a bunch of squash from the garden, a bunch of green beans from the garden, a fresh salad from the garden with tomatoes and, you know, bell peppers, um, maybe uh, some cooked collard greens from the garden, or some coleslaw made with cabbage and carrots, or some fried Swiss chard from the garden, a bunch of things from the garden, and then maybe one thing from the store, like a can of tuna or a frozen steak. So things have kind of flipped. Previously, you know, I would get the majority of my food from the store and the garden would be the garnish. And now the garden is by far the main course and something from the store is just, you know, protein. Things I'm getting from the store right now are mainly just like cans of tuna, cans of salmon, some steak and cooking oil and salt. Everything else is coming from the garden. This is the biggest bell pepper I think I've ever seen. Such a giant bell pepper. I got some lemons coming on. This little bush lemon in a pot. I got some clover back here that's almost three feet tall. It's kind of cool. Some Vulcan chard. I mean, there's just all sorts of stuff out here to eat. It's ridiculous. I've been kind of giving away a lot of produce to friends and neighbors and family because I can't eat it all. And I'd like to trade produce for meat, you know, if I, if I knew somebody that was really good at hunting deer or fishing flounder or something, I'd love to uh, trade produce for meat, but potatoes that are almost ready to harvest, these are probably ready to harvest. Oh, it looks like a red variety of potatoes, so the red ones have done pretty poorly in my opinion. I've heard that they're not really well suited to the south. Let's see how many red potatoes we get out of here. Wow, this actually did pretty decently. Here I am uh, talking crap about the red potatoes and you know, it looks like some of these red potatoes actually, wow, how about that? Maybe I should have left these in here to keep growing. No, but I mean, you can see the plants are pretty much dead. So even though there's a bunch of little tiny ones that didn't make it, I don't think they would have ever turned into these big ones because the plant isn't really capable of doing much at this point but uh wow that's crazy earlier today i was like trash talking the red potatoes and i said you know the red potatoes aren't doing really good at all the red potatoes aren't really making any potatoes the blue potatoes are doing so much better i've been bragging about the blue potatoes the blue potatoes this and the blue potatoes that the blue potatoes have all these anthocyanins and all these different pigments that are supposed to, you know, cure all these diseases and blah, 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 blah. And the red potatoes only do well up north, blah, blah, blah. And here we are with this little fabric pot. And we got one gigantic, two gigantic, three gigantic, four gigantic potatoes. And then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten regular sized, and then two small ones. We got all of these potatoes out of this one small fabric pot. And you can think, you know, I only planted one tuber this size in here. And this is what I got back in return. That's a, that's a 10 or 12 to 1 return on investment. That's pretty awesome. But anyway, uh, this video wasn't supposed to be about potatoes. There's all kinds of potatoes in the garden I can still dig. Here's another one of the shishito peppers. It's just covered in peppers, but... Uh, all my leeks are going to flower, which is really cool to look at. Uh, the collards back there are doing good. This is gigantic collard. My garden is no longer really a garden. It's more of like this food forest. You know, like I said, I have, this is a, this is a mint plant. And this mint plant is past my waist. 
I just stepped on this gigantic collard accidentally and Kit probably killed it, but. This is a gigantic parsnip that's now taller than me. I'm 5'10", almost 5'11", and this parsnip plant is now taller than me. And uh, you gotta be careful touching these. If you touch parsnips, especially if you're out in the sun, you're gonna get all kinds of crazy rashes and burns. I get them all over my feet all the time um, from brushing up the parsnips. Uh, parsnips have all these oils in them that are super uh, phytophototoxic. They cause phytophotodermatitis. So you get the oils on your skin from the plant and then it reacts with ultraviolet light and causes all kinds of crazy rashes and burns. And you can see from my feet, um, I mean, I got them all over. It's all parsnip burn. Parsnip burn is nasty. You get it on your hands and your feet, it spreads. It's like poison ivy because it's an oil. And you don't sometimes notice it, you brush up again. And there's parsnip plants everywhere. I didn't realize how well they did around here or just in general. And there was one time like a year ago that I just threw parsnip seed all over the garden. And turns out like all of them came up and then they made seed. And now there's just a seed bank of parsnip everywhere. And it's probably reverting to wild parsnip, which is even more dangerous. So I never harvest them. But like I said, this is a gigantic parsnip plant that scares the hell out of me. It's probably sucking up lots of nutrients out of my garden and shading out lots of my vegetables, but I'm too afraid to touch it. I guess I could grab a machete and whack it down, but it's also kind of pretty and some of the pollinators seem to like it. I got a bunch of soybeans over here. This is the first year I've been really growing soybeans. They're so cute. I'm growing them for edamame next to my giant collards. And So if you think about it, I got some serious complete proteins here between the soybeans and the collard greens. And then I got pole beans over here. Got some more bell peppers, but uh, my loquat tree is getting gigantic. It's still got all this mint around it. This is a broccoli plant, purple broccoli, that's now taller than me. Um, got some sunflowers in here, some mustard greens, some more sweet potatoes, and some okra. Like I said, it's no longer a garden. It's just this like wild food forest where I have to just kind of forage things. There's some more tomatoes over there. See if we can manage to get out of here. <clears throat> There's a bunch of carrots still in here. Um, it looks like I'm gonna have carrots all summer. Got more carrots than I know what to do with. Uh, here's some of the clover I was talking about that's like waist high. Um, here's a dill plant that's almost as tall as me. I got more potatoes back here in this box that I can't wait to harvest. This is gonna be the bulk of the harvest. I had 38 plants, like I said, but I really, really babied these. They're in a huge raised bed that's like three feet off the ground, covered in wood chips. More squash, more leeks. Uh, I guess we should look at the green beans over here. We already looked at the green beans that are growing in the shade, the pole beans. These must be bush beans. I thought I stopped planting bush beans because they always get nibbled by rodents and insects like this. I thought I, oh man, I came out here yesterday and there were tons of bush beans. And now it looks like a lot of them have gotten eaten by things. I'm gonna have to harvest them all today. But see, these are all yellow Cherokee wax beans. I thought these were supposed to be poles, but apparently they're bushes. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's just a stupid amount of green beans in here. Um, I had to replant these three or four times because the rats kept eating them, the seeds. But now that they're coming out, wow. I mean, look at all that, y'all. That's what I mean when you're finally taking control of your food security. Like I said, the only things I'm going to the grocery store for now are cooking oil, maybe a little bit of protein like cans of salmon and tuna and some steak on a special occasion, and uh, salt, and that's about it. Everything else is coming out of the garden. And that's that's where you wanna you know aim for. You, know, you can't necessarily provide all your protein and all your own cooking oil and all your own salt but you can get to level three pretty easily with just a small backyard. So, uh, got some more Swiss chard back here and more clover and peppers. Had some cabbages I was harvesting. Oh, these collard greens are just ridiculous. Here's some more of that clover that's like waist high. Oh wow, look at that uh, nice butterfly there. How are you? That might be one of the giant swallowtails, which, uh, see it's nectaring on clover right now, but they tend to lay their eggs on uh, citrus exclusively, because the caterpillars can only feed on citrus. 
Um, yeah, I think that's actually a giant swallowtail. It's the largest butterfly in all of North America, and they exclusively uh, host on citrus. But they can nectar on all kinds of things in the adult stage. See, the adult butterfly here is just getting some sugar out of that clover blossom to give it some energy, and it's trying to find one of my citrus trees. I have probably five or six citrus trees in this garden, and then about a mile down the street, I have like 15 citrus trees. And what that beautiful butterfly will do, as beautiful as it is, is a butterfly is, you know, a pest. It will lay its eggs on my citrus trees, and then those eggs will hatch into caterpillars. And the great North American giant swallowtail, its caterpillars uh, mimic bird poop, which is really cool. They look like bird poop, so you don't notice that there's a caterpillar on the citrus tree. It just looks like a bird dropping. It's like a alternating white and black slimy color, and it just looks like bird poop and you don't notice it until it's you know eating all the leaves off your tree and then you know that caterpillar will continue to eat your citrus tree and then it will you know try to form its little cocoon and eventually turn into a butterfly but uh, a lot of them get picked off by wasps in my garden one thing that i do is i put out a lot of uh, wooden stakes and i like to have wood all over the garden for the explicit purpose of attracting paper wasps which are really good hunters of caterpillars and so I gotta be careful. I get stung by wasps occasionally when I go out in my garden just because I have so many wasps everywhere now. I got a real nasty sting yesterday, but uh, I, was, I just saw a wasp just now. I was trying to get up close to it. This is another potato plant that's dead that I need to harvest. This is just growing in some wood chips in the middle of the garden. It's one of the crappy red potatoes. Oh, you know what? I just need to stop talking crap about the red potatoes. Remember I was saying they don't do really well, and then I just opened a pot and it was like full of red potatoes. But uh, anyway, I didn't expect this plant to really yield much because I didn't plant this one. This was a volunteer. It kind of grew underneath a pot that also had potatoes in it. Um, but oh wow, this ground is so hard and compacted. No wonder it didn't make any potatoes. But uh, anyway, um, all the sunchokes are starting to come in now. Sunchokes are a really cool plant. Um, they're pretty much a weed in a lot of dry areas in North America. My area is kind of swampy, so I have to actually make an effort to plant sunchokes on really high and dry, well-draining ground, like you would do squash. They don't necessarily provide a ton of calories because the uh, type of carbohydrate that's contained in uh, sunchokes is uh, called inulin and it's actually not really digestible, so it's it's actually safe for diabetics and you know people who are on low calorie diets, bodybuilders, anybody who wants to you know enjoy the experience of like a starchy type of food, you know, like a mashed potato but doesn't want all of the uh, carbohydrates and starch with it, a sunchoke doesn't impact blood sugar. Look at all these uh, bugs on my tropical fruit tree. It's not cool guys. How about y'all get off of there? I think those are baby uh, leaf-footed bugs. And leaf-footed bugs seem to be really attracted to uh, tomatoes and peppers. See, here's leaf-footed bugs. I'm pulling them off and crushing them. The leaf-footed bugs, uh, they don't really eat your fruits off your tomatoes and stuff, but they kind of like sit there and damage the fruits. Um, look at all these assholes. Squish. They're really hard to squish though because they're big and they like fly off as soon as you try to grab them. But I mean, just look at him trying to destroy all my tropical fruits. This is my tropical fruit tree, all not yours. Screw you, I planted this tree from seed like three years ago and I've been hauling this gigantic fabric pot in the house every winter for the last two years. This thing weighs, this is a 25 or 30 gallon pot. When the soil is wet, the thing probably weighs 240 pounds. It's a gigantic tropical fruit tree and I love it and all these leaf foot bugs are trying to mess up my fruits. These are all the fruits. They start off green and they're poisonous. And then eventually they, uh, there's some more on a different tree. It needs some water really bad. But uh, hopefully it'll rain soon. But yeah, I absolutely love this. This is a dwarf tamarillo. It's a really cool tree. Um, the leaves have a really very, very strong smell which I don't know what the function of that is. It clearly is, you know, attracting pests, probably. Um, the leaves have a ridiculously strong odor. It's kind of unpleasant at first, but you get used to it. Um, this tree needs some water.
Those leaves aren't turning yellow because of lack of fertilizer, it's lack of water. But uh, the fabric pots dry out so quickly and this is a tropical tree and really needs a lot of water. So I should make a, a better effort to uh, water this thing more often. But um, yeah, I probably do need to water that. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, glad we got to talk about different levels of food security. Don't feel bad if you're just starting out and you're in an apartment or you don't have a lot of space. Just look at your grocery bill and focus on the things you're spending money on, you know. You probably spend money on lettuce or microgreens or kale or arugula or bok choy or all these, you know, things that you can actually grow in an apartment just under some lights or in a sunny window or on a balcony. And then eventually, you know, spread out, you know, think about getting a raised bed or something else. And, you know, one day you'll probably have a backyard food forest and then eventually you might get some land, some acreage. That's my next step. Um, all the blueberries are finally starting to come in. Mmm, blueberries. Mmm. I love blueberries. They're delicious. Oh look, it's a farm dog. See, I don't have a big farm. I just have a backyard, so I have a little farm dog. He's not very big, but he's, he's all right. Here's another example of something you can do on just a backyard, you know, apartment balcony. This is just a tiny little uh, four by four porch that sticks off the back of my trailer. And I got some bell peppers. I have some asparagus. I got a bunch of chives, uh, basil, uh, oregano. I even have a tomato that was doing well and this week decided to get some disease. I also have a muscadine grapevine that's growing on the porch and a green bean and a leek. So just on a tiny little four by four patio, you can have a bunch of different little vegetables and herbs. I got mint growing everywhere that I don't even have to mess with. I love these fabric pots. If you're in a place where you can't have a raised bed, just buy like a 40 gallon fabric pot. And a 40 or 50 gallon fabric pot is gonna be the same thing as a small raised bed. So you could do this on an apartment balcony or you could do this anywhere. If you're renting and you know you can't tear up the yard to make a raised bed, just buy a 50 gallon fabric pot and you'll be straight. But uh, anyway, Thank you all for tuning in today, and I think we looked at most of the stuff in the garden. We looked at the flowers in the front yard, we looked at the peppers and the green beans over here, the green beans in the back corner, we looked at the squash, we looked at some sunchokes, we looked at the soybeans. I think we saw most of the stuff today, but uh, oh, there's the papaya trees that are probably hot. But uh, anyway, thank you all for tuning in to uh, Primitive Organic Garden and Guitar today, and happy Memorial Day. if. That's a thing for you today, and hope you're eating well. Cheers.